Okay. So as you see, the, this definition here, spectral density, this is the Fourier transform of autocovariance here. Okay. The Fourier transform is very similar. It, uh, <coughs> it's very similar to the to the Z transform. If you replace this e to the negative j omega l with z to the negative l. Okay, so this is uh, sort of a big picture. This is getting us something that looks like the Z transform of a deterministic signal. Okay, <coughs> and the great thing about this is now look at the left hand side. It's something related to omega, which is frequency. And on the right hand side, it's something related, it's a time domain signal, the autocorrelation of x. So it's building up some connections between time domain and frequency domain, which is uh, the same idea for in the deterministic case between time sequence and Z transform. Okay, and because of this definition, uh, there is a inverse Fourier transform. So we can go from this side. We if we have the time time domain autocorrelation co autocovariance, we can evaluate the spectral density, and we can do it backwards. If we have the spectral density we can obtain the autocovariance from this inverse Fourier transform. This is just a uh, definition, but in real, uh, when doing real calculations, we usually don't use this equation to do inverse Fourier transform because uh, that's usually pretty complicated and not necessary. What we do is uh, we usually refer to Fourier transform tables, like the, the Z transform tables. Laplace transform tables. We do that instead of this equation here. So this is for uh, autocorrelation, autocovariance of x. But we can also do uh, cross spectral density of x and y. So we're considering how x and y are related in time domain and in frequency domain. The definition uh, is just the same, replacing x and y, replacing the indices here. So with this, <coughs> this new definition here, we can, have, we can have a sort of a picture of w the, the meaning of the variance of a random var variable. So if I evaluate, look at this equation here, x, x, x of zero, this is uh, how x, k, is related to xk itself. So it's the uh, covariance matrix of x of this random process. All right? So this immediately you see uh, L is 0. So I'm going to get 1 divided by 2 pi, negative pi, pi, the spectral density integrated over negative pi and pi. All right? So this is the area under a spectral density curve. So usually a spectral density curve looks like uh, looks like this. It's going to be uh, symmetric with respect to uh, the frequency. So it looks like this. So you now know the variance is just uh, the area under the spectral density curve by looking at this equation here. <coughs> okay, so as an exercise, I want to, to be able to understand this property here. This property that, uh, as we were talking about the uh, covariance matrix of X, the, this is talking about how a random process is, uh, the autocorrelation of a random process looks like. Uh, if we look at Let's say, using this picture here. If I look at how the random process, how different elements in the random process are related to the other elements in the time domain, then this equation, this uh, fact is telling us x, x of k is always mostly, most related to itself. It's 
if, if you compare the relationship between xk and xk plus one, it's not that related compared to sk related to itself. So it's kind of intuitive, and this is exactly what this, this guy is talking about, okay? So the proof is uh, by using a definition, by using the definition of auto coherent. Okay, so I'm gonna prove this guy larger than or equal to L for any L, okay? So the proof uses this property that uh, if I evaluate x uh, k minus mx, then x k, I'm gonna build something that, that's uh, that that's really, that's gonna give me the auto co covariance with time index L. So I gotta have something that looks like this. Let's see. I'm gonna use transpose or not transpose. I'm gonna do the scalar case for simplicity. So I won't need the transpose here. Yeah, I'm gonna do the scalar case. I'm gonna square this term, so there's a plus or minus sign inside. So think about this, this guy inside is always, is always non-negative, all right? So you can see, if I take the expectation of something that's not uh, negative, then this guy will always be non-negative, all right? So with this observation, uh, the result is immediate because this guy equals to expected value of uh, xk minus mx x k plus l minus m x. This is gonna be plus minus two. This, this is the cross product term. And then there's gonna be this uh, z squared term. So I said I'm gonna do the scalar case. Okay. <coughs> so let's see what these three terms equals to. The first term is gonna be plus minus two expected value of this guy, which is gonna meet, give me the uh, auto covariance with time index L. And this, the third and the, third and the second term, what are they? The expected value of these two. It's gonna be the <coughs> variance of the random uh, variable, right? Variable at k, then this is the variance. This is uh, the variance, okay? Which is equal to the auto covariance with time index zero. Then this way you get uh, two x, 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 zero plus minus two x, x, l is uh, non-negative, which is, uh, directly gives us the result here. So this is quite enough. Uh, first of all, we have seen that the auto covariance uh, of a random process is symmetric, right? If it's uh, this guy is exactly equal to this guy. So if we plot the shape of this uh, auto Coherence is going to look like something looks like this. It's maximum when time index is zero. And then it gra it's going to gradually decrease because uh, this is the maximum. The maximum value occurs here. Then uh, at other time indices, it's going to be something look like this. And then then it's going to be symmetric. So it, this, if this is L, this is zero. This is how uh, it looks like. Okay. <coughs> linear, you mean the random process is linear? From here to here? Uh, that's just the property of expectation. 
so because uh, the expected value of x plus y if they are random then uh, equals the expected value of x expected value of y it's only because of this <coughs> you can verify this either by definition yeah probably easiest way is by definition hmm? So uh, I, I mentioned that sort of at the uh, end of the last lecture, uh, in this class, unless I specifically say it's not, I will assume the random process are stationary. So that means these properties doesn't change with respect to time index k. Yeah. Last term. Yeah, 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 that's exactly here, yeah. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, with these concepts, we'll be very quickly go to the uh, main course of today. Uh, before I start that, let me just mention one more definition here, white noise. This is very common in engineering. So white noise, first of all, is a random process, okay? So it has a time index k inside. White noise is saying a random process that uh, if I'm considering how uh, at different time, k not equal to j, at different time, these two are related. Then if it's white, if it's completely white, then these two guys are not related at all. Okay, so if we evaluate the auto covariance of this process, if L is not equal to zero, then the, the auto covariance is gonna be zero. So they are not related to each other at all at different times. It's only related to itself. Well, we have uh, the, in this case, if it's one dimensional, it, this is the variance. If it's multi-dimensional, this is the covariance matrix. Okay, so uh, uh, here, we probably will mostly using the one dimensional case. So this is the variance. You can see it's a standard deviation squared. Okay. So in contrary, if we if we have something that's uh, related to, if x k is related has some kind of correlation with x j for different time, then this process is called uh, colored noise. Okay. <coughs> in this case, in this expression here. I am saying that, mm, let me do this picture, xk plus l. I'm saying for these two random variables at different times, okay, they have the same variance and same standard deviation. Uh, this is for the stationary case. So this, this again, is the concept of stationary, means the statistic properties. This is the second moment of the random uh, variable. The statistic properties doesn't change with respect to time, they are the same. But we can have a general case where, for example, the variance at this time is slightly different with uh, the variance at this time. So that's the non-stationary case. I'm, I'm gonna assume it's zero mean, this white noise. Then look at this, equa this equation here, it's saying, okay, this is the, uh, classical function that if if k equals to j is one, otherwise it's always zero, okay? So here, you, you notice the difference here is this, <coughs> this variance value depends on time now. If k equals to j, then this is one. The variance is gonna be time dependent. This is, uh, in this picture, it just means the variance at this time and the variance at this time they can be different for non-stationary white noise. <coughs> okay? Now, this is the main I content I wanna talk about. How, if I have a random process, I filter it through a linear system, linear time invariant system, then how the output 
and how <coughs> we can obtain something that uh, looks like the frequency domain analysis for a single input, single output system. Okay. So first of all, the first thing to notice, if U is a random process, and I filter it through an LTI system whose transfer function is G, okay, the output, so this is the definition, this is how the output is mathematically defined. You see, the output is gonna be, these, these terms are, are fixed for LTI system, okay? So it's a linear combination of a lot of random variables. So you can see, th the output is gonna be still random. It's gonna be still a, be a random process, okay? And because it's still a random process, we can talk about things like uh, auto covariance, and we can talk about uh, spectral density, which we discussed before, okay? So I wanna be able to, I want you to be able to understand, <coughs> in this case, the pictures we're gonna look like we're gonna uh, we're gonna be looking at are these. So, in the in the case of random processes, if you are random process, if you is a random process, then these pictures hold. Okay. If I evaluate the autocovariance of U passing through a G by standard convolution, then the output here is gonna be the uh, cross covariance between u and y here. And then uh, if I, the input to g is the cross covariance of y u, then the output is going to be the auto covariance of y. So uh, the reason for doing this is immediate if I combine these two pictures. So first of all, you see x u u l and that I as someone has mentioned at the beginning of the class, this guy is uh, deterministic. This guy is no longer random. This is, uh, this is like the second moment of this random process. If I pass this through G, I'm gonna get X, U, Y, L, which is equal to X, Y, U, negative L, all right? And if I pass x, y, u, negative l, look at this picture here, through g, <coughs> z inverse. So uh, here, if it's negative l, if this is l, this is g. If it's negative l, it's gonna be g, uh, z negative one. Then I'm gonna get x, y, y, negative l, which is, you, you know that this guy is equal to X, Y, Y, L. So now, the final goal is actually here. So now I have a uh, evaluation of how the input and output, the statistic properties of the input and output are related. The autocovariance between you uh, of the input are connected with the autocovariance of the output. And their connections are this. So if I write it, Mathematically, it's gonna be G, Z, negative one, G, Z, X, U, U, L, okay? So, you see, there are two things to, to pay attention to here. First of all, uh, the transfer function is used twice here. It's intuitive to understand in this case because uh, as we have learned, these, the autocovariance is a second order second moment, second order type of statistic property. So because of its second order, so this guy is sort of like used twice, okay? <coughs> and then the second thing to pay attention to here is this guy, okay? I quickly mentioned it uh, here. If x, let's say, yu, we use yu, l is passing through GZ gives me X, uh, Y, Y, L. Then this is gonna give us X, Y, U, negative L passing through GZ inverse. Uh, GZ to the power of negative one is gonna give me uh, this. 
okay? So uh, to, to see this, uh, has anyone seen this before? So to see why this is valid, uh, we just evaluate the convolution here. So using looking at the first first uh, relationship here, x, y, y, l is the convolution between, let's say, this is the g is the inverse Lie transform of g, g. Mm. I'm going to use g index k, let's say k. Okay, y, u, let's say L minus k. This is the convolution, and this is, uh, this is the, the summation issue is actually k, right? This is the definition of uh <coughs> convolution in the discrete time case. Okay, so now if I just uh, sh uh, make this L, change, replace L with negative L, I'm gonna get here, One more paper. X, Y, Y, negative L equal to summation is again over K, G, K, X, Y, U, negative L minus K. Okay? <coughs> now, G, Z, this is the Z transform of g k, g negative k, right? This is the definition of z transform. What about g z inverse? K, right? Which is exactly the same as because uh, k is the uh, index that's going to be put in the summation. So I can do this. Uh, let's see. G negative k. Let's see whether this holds. Let me check. So I'm replacing every k with negative k. And because this is a summation over k, so this guy is equivalent. These two guys are the same. Any questions for this one? No? Oh, right here. Right. This is a, a trick in, in the Z transform, which is saying if GK is related to GZ, then G negative K the Z transform is going to be G Z inverse. This is a this is a useful property in the definition of Z transform. Okay, so let's see. We were here. I want to I want to show this guy. I want to show this guy. You see, it's exactly the same using the same trick here. It's exactly the same as uh, I just replace every k with a negative k. Negative L plus K. Okay? So now you see <coughs> G negative K here and G negative K here. All right? So now you immediately see uh, we're going to have something. We're going to have something. This is related to G Z inverse. So this is the convolution of this guy with this guy, with, with this guy, x, y, u, l. So this is the convolution between g, k, and next this guy, negative l, negative l. OK? So uh, we started with here. I want you to understand this guy. So by looking at this convolution here, this is exactly saying, uh, if the input is this guy negative L, then it's it's like now immediately from here, it's it's this guy the Z G Z negative one passing through this uh, 
transfer function and then obtain this output. Hmm? Yeah, that's the that's for the causal case. If the signal has no component uh, for a negative time index. So is he, is this guy? If what we have been learning is is actually this guy. If u doesn't have value for a negative time index, then the convolution is is for uh, all the contents with positive time index. The the case here, the only difference here is uh, if u has values for negative k, then we have to consider them in the convolution. Yeah, so in that case, it's actually from negative infinity to positive infinity. Yeah, and to go one step further, the, the reason for why this negative values has to be considered is because uh, in this case, because, because of this, because auto covariance, they have negative time index. They have values for negative time indexes, okay? So let's see. The main, the main idea I want you to understand is this guy. And if you see what we have just derived, <coughs> OK? If you see what we have just derived, this main equation here, This guy. <coughs> this is describing the time domain relationship of u and y. Okay? Now, we can very easily, because of this fact, we can very easily evaluate the frequency domain relationship between these two guys. So, uh, we discussed in the beginning of the class if this is, uh, if the autocovariance is expressing the time domain information, what will be? Uh, the, the term that's describing the frequency domain property, spectral density, okay? So this fact gives me, gives us very easy evaluations of frequency domain uh, relationship between the input and output. So it's gonna be, this is the spectral density of the output Y. It's gonna be equal to the spectral density of U and in the middle, it's just going to be g e negative j omega g. Just replace d with uh, e j omega. Okay, so it, it gives us this uh, evaluation of the spectral density. So now, because of this, if I if I have a linear time linear time invariant system and I give it as a, a input that contains noise, I can very easily verify how the output how the in input noise is affecting my output, okay, because of this. So let's, if, if, the, if the system, let's say, has certain kind of frequency response, for example, uh, I'll use a simple case. If the system has certain kind of frequency response, if this is the magnitude response of the system, then I can immediately know the output noise, the input noise will be amplified at these frequencies because of the uh, system filtering process, okay? So this is the main messages for uh, filtering a random process. And then uh, the details are coming back here. So the details are because of these two relationships. And how these are, why these are valid, why the autocovariance of U Going through GZ gives me uh, auto cross cross covariance between U and Y is because of these uh, detailed mathematics here. Okay, so just by using the definitions, the auto the cross covariance U Y with time index L is going to be equal to the definition. So let me here. If I if I write the mathematic definitions of this. What will it be? It's going to be u k minus uh, mean of u. Again, I'm assuming they are stationary. Y uh, k 
k plus l minus mean of y. Okay? So uh, for simplicity, I think here I'm assuming uh, zero mean. I'm assuming zero mean, so I don't need to uh, put this uh, minus mu and minus my in this case. Okay. <coughs> so to evaluate, uh, to, to go from here to here, I'm using two things. The first thing is uh, y k plus l equals to uh, the convolution between g i and u k plus l negative i. First of all, I'm using the convolution here. So uh, I'm using this with substitute this guy to here. And then, uh, so here, this guy is going to give me the result here. And then the second fact I'm using is that uh, they are egotic. This is an egotic process. Because it's egotic, we can do, we can use the time average to evaluate the, uh, the, a the average, the actual average defined by this guy. Okay? So here, you see, this guy is this guy, and this guy is this guy. So uh, <coughs> using the fact that G is deterministic, the LTI system is deterministic, the randomness happens in the input signal u here. So here, uh, put this guy inside, and then the average, the time domain average can be taken inside this random uh, value here. Then using this is equal to this, OK? Because uh, this guy, for egotic process, it equals to uk, uk plus L minus I. And then this guy is nothing but the autocovariance of U with the time index L minus I. Okay? So this guy, you see, this convolution here is the convolution between G, G, G I with respect to the autocovariance of U. So this is this guy. So that's the, the detailed mathematics to show you why this holds. And very similarly, uh, this is, uh, this, this fact can be uh, verified, okay? So we have talked about why we are doing this uh, a few moments ago. So we thought we, we were doing this because in a general LTI system, I can do this evaluation of the output frequency response using using the input frequency response and uh, the transfer function, the frequency response of the transfer function, okay? And now, if there are random processes, then instead, this is the, this is the mirrored version of this result here, okay? So, you have to you have to use the transfer function twice to get the spectrum of the output, and the intuition again is because uh, auto covariance is second moment property, and uh, the result, the spectral density, is a second moment property. Okay. So, uh, if you had any confusions when we derived this, this is because uh, draw these pictures first, and then use the fact that x, y, u is equal to x, u, y with the time index negative L, okay? So just use these two facts to get uh, the result. I don't have it here. To get the result that uh, x, y, y, L equals to g z negative y g z x u u l okay so think about 
this question. Over here, every, everything is single input, single output. The transfer function is single input, single output. What will happen if I have a vector of random process, a vector of output, and this guy is a multiple input, multiple output system? So things will be slightly more complicated there because now I have to be very careful about the dimensions, about how signals are manipulated here. So this is more detailed, that this is what I mean. I have to be very careful about, look at the final result. I have to be very careful about how the different, now these are matrices now, how different matrices are placed in the final result here. In the single input, single output case, I don't have to worry. I can put this here. I can put this here with no problem. But for multiple input, multiple output system, I have to be very careful. So let's take a look what are the differences here, more detailed. First of all, uh, because of the dimension differences, the cross covariance between U and Y is the transpose of the cross covariance between Y and U with a uh, time index negative L. This is because by definition, this guy equals to this. Now uh, we are doing multiple input, multiple output case. We have to use the transfer here, okay? So if I shift, if I swap the orders, then I'm gonna get E y k plus l minus m y u k minus m u transpose okay so there's a transpose sign and uh, this guy the time the time index the difference between the time index k and k plus l is negative l and this result is intuitive to understand because imagine if u is uh, N1 dimensional and Y is N2 dimensional. What will be the dimension for the cross, covar cross covariance between what U and Y? It's gonna be, it's gonna be looking at this guy, it's gonna be N1 times N2, right? Because uh, N1 is the dimension for this vector. So uh, what will be the dimension for, for this guy? If I don't look at the transpose, what will be the dimension for this guy? It's gonna be N2 times N1, right? So you immediately you see the transpose has to be there to make the dimension to be correct uh, in the first place, okay? So everything here is the same. This connection is the same. These two connections are the same. The only, the difference you have to pay attention to is this. So now I have, uh, <coughs> I have my notation here is, I have to be very careful about my notation here. I, I had better to be more rigorous. I have better to use G, small g here. So small g is the inverse, inverse z transform of gz, okay? So y, y, look at this picture here. It's gonna be the convolution between GL and the input uh, cross covariance of YU here. This guy, as we have seen, is equals this guy. Look, no, notice the transpose sign, okay? And then look at the first picture. Look at the first picture. I see XUY is the convolution between G negative L and uh, X, U, U, negative L. And then there's a transpose sign here. So because of this transpose sign, this guy is gonna be uh, put on the right-hand side. This guy equals to G, L, convolution, X, U, U, negative L, convolution, the transpose, transpose, G, negative L, transpose. So that's why this guy is giving us this guy, okay? And the fact that there's no transpose sign here is because uh, it's symmetric. The uh, autocorrelation and auto, 
autocovariance of U are symmetric. Mm. So we don't have a transfer function. Okay. So these this slide, I believe the results here are not directly read in the course reader. So but it will be pretty useful when we study uh, linear quadratic Gaussian control. Okay, so what we have down, think about what we have down since the start of the today's lecture. We have been mostly dealing with uh, transfer function type of uh, filtering a random process. But uh, <coughs> we can easily do filtering random processes in a state space without problem, okay? And I, I think in certain sense, this is easier in the state space case, okay? So consider WK is a zero mean white random process. And then I filter this WK through a state space system, okay? And I assume uh, the initial state are random in this case and uncorrelated with WK. So if I, if I want to know how on average the system behaves, then I can take the uh, expected value of this equation here. The expected value on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. Notice W is zero mean. So if I take the expected value, then this guy is going to go, uh, is going to vanish. So the mean behavior, average behavior, is going to be the mean of x k plus one is going to be uh, ak mx uh, of k. So now let me ask you a question. Is xk mm, white or not? So the definition of white is uh, it's not related to So it's not white, it's colored, because uh, now the, the value at time k plus one is directly related to x k, so it's not white, right? So good, we're immediately using what we are learning. Now, that's the mean, and it's always the case. If, I, if we evaluate the mean, the first moment, then we have to think about the second moment, the covariance. So with the result here, we can very easily derive the covariance relationship, okay? So by definition, the covariance of, uh, let me use x, x, which is defined by uh, x, x, let's see how I define, x, k. If I define the <coughs> autocovariance of x, uh, simplify the notation, just uh, x, here. Then x k plus one is going to be equal to expected value of x k plus one minus m x k plus one. So let's see. I think I'm doing. I'm going to do the uh, vector case, random vector case. Minus m x k plus one, okay? So I'm gonna use, so uh, now to be able to evaluate this guy, I'm gonna have to use, combine these two equations here. So I know this, this guy equals to, so I'm gonna subtract this here, a k x k minus m x k plus plus c w k w k okay <coughs> this is a pretty useful observation now uh, let's see how I want to do this so next time I wish you'll be able to connect this result here so what whenever you see something that looks like this so this guy is this guy 
filtered by, not filtered, multiplied by some matrix here, and then plus some noise, then this guy will immediately become AK, XK. So I will write down, write down the result first, and then I will give you some intuition about the result. So let's say W, I'm going to say the variance of W, w is WK. This is exactly the result uh, written on the note. Okay, so I want I want you to be able to very quickly recognize this fact here. Okay, so if you, uh, the first thing to notice is, you see again, the system matrices up here are used twice. This is because uh, auto covariance and variance, auto covariance, they are all second moment properties. So the system matrices are always used twice if I'm talking about second moment properties, okay? And the detailedly, you can evaluate for the first term to occur. This is for, this is from the multiplication of this guy. With, with this guy, with the part of this guy. So it's useful now to write down on this side. Plus B, W, K, W, K. Cancel. So this term comes from the uh, multiplication of this term with this term here. So you see, because of the transpose sign here, this guy will be transposed and put ahead. And then I'm gonna have a transpose of AK, which is this guy on the right, okay? So in the middle, this guy is occurring because E XK minus MXK, XK minus MXK, transpose. Uh, this is the definition of XK, okay? So that's how this first term uh, comes out. Anyone has questions for this part? So two things to recognize. First of all, system matrix appear twice. Second of all, uh, transpose sign here, okay? And the this term here occurs because of the product of this with respect to between this and this. Okay, again, you see this guy, BW term, is gonna come on the right. And then because of transpose sign, this BW is gonna go to the right and has a transpose sign here. And then in the middle is because uh, we I take the expected value of WK and W transpose K, I get uh, the autocovariance of W. Okay, so questions? Probably it's more, it's better I've defined this way. Yeah, because according to this definition, this is K, K, yeah. So no questions for this part, all right? So these are the main equations for filtering random process in the state space, how the mean evolves and how the uh, covariance evolves. Okay? So imagine if uh, in, the, in the deterministic case, we have steady state response and we have transient response. In the uh, stochastic process, we also have uh, transient, re transient behavior and steady state behavior. So 
in the steady state, if, let's say, if the system matrices A k, B k, B w k, they are constant matrices, and this is a constant, and this is W k is a constant. So it's, intu it's intuitive to understand that the system will reach a steady state behavior. And this slide is discussing exactly in the steady state how uh, the mean, the dynamics of the mean and the dynamics of the covariance is going to look like. Okay. So if if the if this is constant and the matrix A is uh, stable, by stable I mean the eigenvalues are inside the unit circle in the discrete time k. What will happen to the mean of x? Mean of uh, x, yeah, mean of x. If this is stable. Converge to zero, exactly, right? So if it's a steady state and A is stable, then I'm gonna have the mean is gonna converge to zero. However, it's important to, to, to understand that the variance is not gonna converge to zero, okay? So mathematically, you see, if these are constant matrices, then at the steady state, it, it, it's sort of like uh, this, treat this as an input to this equation here. Then you see, this is not zero. So there will be a steady state for the covariance and it's not zero. So to evaluate this, you just replace this, you just assume at a steady state, xk and xk plus one, they are the same, okay? So just put this here. Then this is how the steady state covariance is defined. Uh, this uh, discrete time Lyapunov equation, okay? So we can solve this equation to get uh, the steady state covariance. As we are talking about the Apnoff equation, I want to give a quick mm, review of the Apnoff equation. Okay, so it's pretty, th there are several ways to understand this. One way, at least one way, is by looking at the energy of the entire system. So I'm going to say, define the classical definition. I'm going to use P here. Classical definition of a uh, energy function for LTI system, state space system. Okay, so if I define this, what we want to do, we want the energy, this would be xk, xk, so at time k. So xk plus one, we want the energy to decrease, okay? So this guy is gonna be equal to one divided by two x transpose k plus one p x k plus one. Okay, so I'm gonna assume I'm gonna be using the system dynamics as the follows. X k plus one equal to a x k without input. So I wanna see how the energy of this system is gonna evolve. Then this is nothing but one divided by two. The first term is gonna be uh, x transpose k times a transpose. Then I have p a x k. Then the second term doesn't change. So this is exactly how uh, the term A transpose P A minus P occurs in uh, the Apnoff equation, okay? And the second, second thing to, to notice is uh, I mentioned we want the energy to decrease with respect to time. So we want the energy to be uh, <coughs> decreasing. So this is what we want. This is what we want, okay? So we, wa we want the energy to decrease. That means the energy at the next time is gonna be smaller than, en than the energy uh, at time k. So we want this guy. So this is uh, a negative value, non-positive value, because it's a quadratic function, okay? 
kill you, so hard read. Let's see. Yeah, we can do both. So Q can be uh, Q is positive semi-definite, right? So exactly this is giving us A transpose P A minus P equal to negative Q. So there are many ways to write the order. But uh, this is how the discrete time the optimal equation comes from. Okay. <coughs> All right, so there are steady states that we can evaluate for uh, filtering a random process through a state space system. So this is the steady state variant. In the steady state, uh, this also, let me check the notation. We can also evaluate the autocovariance at steady state. So this is, this, this the picture to think about is uh, after very long, suppose this is time zero. After very, very long time, after very, very long time, the things is gonna settle down. It's gonna be xk, xk plus l, xk plus l. Okay, things are settling down, but xk and xk plus l, they still can have, they still be, can be connected with each other. Okay, it's just the, the process that settled down. So. It's still meaningful to evaluate this guy, which is defined by if xk is zero mean, which holds in this case. So definition of autocovariance here. Okay, so mm, I want to I want you to check. I want you to see that this result is is this guy. First of all, uh, it's gonna be the system matrix is gonna be used. Let's say here. K L times. Right? This is not one; it's, it's L. Okay, it's because uh, to to be able to evolve from X K to X K plus L, I have to go through the system. I have to go through this by L times. So there's an L here. So this is the the reason for this guy. And then there's a transpose sign here because this is a transpose. So this is why it occurs. Okay. More detailedly, if you want to check. If you want to check the result, you have to use, so I'll just give you this hint, then you can check the result further. So it's going to be how xk plus l is related to xk. It's going to be a l plus, so this is by using th this dynamic, a xk plus uh, b w Okay, yes. So this is assuming this is the system dynamics. Then you can you can verify this is actually using the 232 uh, result. So this guy is defined by summation of uh, a l minus one. Let me check the notate index. Mm. I'm gonna use j, I think. J. So the summation of J, B, W, W, J. J from K to K plus L minus one. Okay, so if you wanna rigorously verify this, why this intuition holds, uh, you're gonna need this result here. Okay. So uh, again, if this is for the time index L, if I want to verify time index negative L, then uh, I have to use this fact, which it can be verified by definition of uh, autocovariance. So it's again this, so you're gonna get the transpose of this guy, which is uh, this result here. I want to use one example to show um, <coughs> why these are useful. So this is the example looks like this. If I filter a random process, so I must, let's see, yeah, I'm, if I'm filtering zero mean white random process through a first order system, this is a first order system, 
okay? Then, so some questions we can ask. First of all, how the mean of x is going to behave like? It's going to go from some initial values, and then in the end, the mean is going to convert to zero. So if the input is zero mean, then the output at steady state will also be zero mean. That's something uh, that can be easily checked and remembered. For the steady state variance equation, then I'm going to have, again, uh, the system parameters has to occur twice because it's a second order property. So the steady state x ss equal to a square x ss, and then this is also going to be square. Okay? So at steady state, you can see the output has the same variance as the input. It can be very easily verified that these are correct. So simply by looking at this, uh, this equation, system equation here, what will happen if A equals to zero? Then the output is going to be exactly the same as the input. So the output variance is going to be exactly the same as the input. So you see, output variance is exactly the same as the input. So I'm checking intuitively why this makes sense. What will happen if uh, A is, I can't, <coughs> I cannot, I cannot, I cannot use A is one because in that case, the system has no input. So I, I shouldn't be using that. Yeah, probably the, 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 the best way to check is to let A equal to zero, and you see this has to make sense. Hmm? One over two, okay. You mean this one? Which equation? Hmm. Okay. So if A equals to point five, then I'm gonna get so if one be one minus thing is gonna be two square root of uh, W <coughs> mm -hmm. X should mm -hmm. it's not the the what the square root you when you're talking about this equation or this e okay? Uh, pay attention that I'm I'm talking about the variance though. The variance you have to sort of square. Variance is right. Yeah. So that's the difference. So that's why it, the the parameters is gonna be uh, has some kind of square terms. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. S, S. Yeah, first of all, if I, so I have sort of said A cannot be one in this case because input doesn't go to the output, yeah. So I'm sort of assuming A doesn't equal to one. In the second case, even that happens. So this is quite, quite, quite useful to, to check your understanding. Even if A, even if A is one, what will be X SS in this case? Under, under all the stated assumptions here. Zero. Any, uh, any second? Uh, I'm just asking what this value is, is gonna be equal to. Mm. So let me say here, I'm saying the writing, every words here actually are important. So x0, the, the, the saying of x0 uncorrelated with wk is, has a hidden message that x0 is a random. I have a random initial condition. 
So if I have a random initial condition, what will be the steady state variance for x? Yeah, x0 is random. So it's going to be whatever the variance of at the initial time, right? So it's not zero in this case under this stated condition. Okay? <coughs> so the, as a practical example about this, about some, some initial condition being random, for example, can be uh, if I'm going to move a robot, let's say, move a robot arm, okay? So when I put the robot arm, uh, I'm not using any control command. I'm, I'm just uh, starting the system. Then the initial condition, in certain ways, there are certain randomness inside. Because when last time I moved the robot back, okay, there might be some differences between the absolute zero position of the robot arm. So that's a the randomness is not that significant over there, so uh, that's one example of uh, initial condition being not perfectly constant. Okay. So uh, I want to. We have sort of talked about this. So if the if the steady state variance looks like this, then we can we can evaluate uh, the steady state auto covariance. Okay, it's gonna be, see this, uh, it's gonna be the, the system dynamics is gonna occur sort of L times because of the L index here. And if you plot it, it looks like this. The picture looks like this. The auto covariance of X at steady state. So it's gonna be the maximum when L equal to zero. So here, L A is less than one in this case. Okay, let's say less than one. Sorry, yeah, I can do this. So A is, the system is stable. So A, the absolute value of A is less than one. So it's gonna be look like this. The uh, auto covariance maximum here and then gradually decreases as L increases. And when A is, let's say, I'm gonna check several values. A equal to negative A. A equal to negative one. Which which curves do you think are corresponding? So I have three curves. I'm, let me say A equal to 0.5. Suppose these are the values generated in this plot. Which co which curve should be corresponding to these? And why? Yeah, if A is greater then it means the system, the system dynamics, this guy is sort of, it's not rigorous, it's sort of more related to x, okay? If this is 0.8, then it's definitely more related to xk compared to the case a equal to 0.1. So as a, as a result, if a is larger, if a is closer to one, then the relationship between, so this is x1, so the relationship between xk and xk plus one is gonna be larger than the case of smaller a. So the, the most top curve, this curve, is gonna be corresponding to this guy. So this is this. And then this last uh, curve here is the case for that guy. And this guy is facing the middle. Okay? So. Uh, I wish you to understand these are intuitive results because of how the system dynamics evolves. Okay? So we have been talking about all discrete time cases, but uh, in continuous time, everything works. So I won't repeat the analysis again, so I will just uh, summarize the results on this slide. In the reader, there are more detailed derivations, but uh, these are the key results that we're gonna be used in ME233, okay? So how the spectral density, uh, every, everything has the same structure. The spectral density is again, it's gonna be, the system has to be used twice. The system dynamics has to be used twice. Okay, 
mean, reverence, and steady faith. So I will finish today's lecture by re reminding you the equivalence between these two. Okay, so g j omega is is a complex number, right? So let's say let's say it's a plus b j. Then this g negative j omega. I have to use omega somewhere. So let's say omega here. Then this is a minus b j omega. And then when you multiply them together, it's just the uh, magnitude of the uh, complex number here, okay? So that's uh, something to uh, check. You can easily understand, okay? So uh, if you don't remember how the Lyapunov equations look like and how the solutions look like, uh, you can check this appendix slide. So for the discrete time Lyapunov equation, the solution is gonna be like this. And continuous time Lyapunov equation, the solution is like this. In many times, uh, you have to be, w whenever you are asked about the solution of something, you have to understand what are the conditions for the solution to exist. So the, the, up the discrete time and continuous time the optimal equation has a unique solution if and only if these conditions hold. So I will, for example, the discrete time case is uh, this equation. This eigenvalue of something has to hold. And you see, it makes sense. If, if let's say, A is uh, stable, all the eigenvalues are inside the unit circle, then this condition obviously holds, right? So all of the eigenvalues multiplied together, it's impossible to generate one. Take any two eigenvalues. Okay, so see you next week. <laughs>